Um, Father, through your word, would you show us more and more of who your heart is, who you are, and help set our hearts right in a proper posture as we come before you. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please be seated. I wonder, what do we look for in other people? I think this is an interesting question that I can think about way back uh, when I was younger and in grade school. This might be a question. What do you look for in your friends? What sort of qualities do you like? Uh, often when you're younger, this is often used in a, a romantic way too. Or what do you hope to find in a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Oh, I want someone tall and handsome or someone's funny or all these different things. And we may have our internal lists of what we look for in another person. And it's always an interesting question, and I find as I get older, I will look back and realize, oh, who were my closest friends? Who were the people close to me? And often I do notice common traits. And sometimes they match what I thought I thought, maybe in my teen years, and some of them surprise me too. Oh, perhaps I'm actually drawn to these kinds of people without even knowing that. And perhaps for you, as you reflect on who are the people that you can feel a common spirit with, who do you feel a kinship with, who are you drawn to, attracted, whether both in a friendship or romantic way, that we may have certain traits that we actually hope for and look for in other people. And it is a great question actually to ask. I think it teaches us uh, something about ourselves. But here as we come on Sunday uh, here to hear from God's word, um, we've been thinking about, and I showed this picture last time, God, who is he? And my question is, what does God look for in us? If we have our own eternal lists, which we may be aware of or may not be aware of, what about God? What does he look for in other personalities and people as he scans and sees all of us on earth living out our lives? And I think this parable is a little bit about that. So we're going to be looking um, at this in Luke 18. Who is God? What God looks for in us? And I've been enjoying looking at... Uh, these parables. In this section of Luke, as you can see in these last weeks and sermons, the passage is often very, very short. And Jesus will masterfully speak a parable in sometimes just two or three sentences. And I find a great effect. And each of these little parables is worth our time and attention to say, what is Jesus saying here? And what kind of effect would it have had on his listeners at the time? So let's reread it again, and then we're going to slow down through it. And here, uh, again, this, as I showed the children, would be imagining Jesus sitting with people and using everyday stories. And it's a little hard. They didn't, it's not like Jesus printed out or had a projector then. So telling a story is a little different because you don't know the ending. So it's a little different for us, those of us who read the Bible. We kind of know the ending, but let's try to withhold a little bit from that and try to understand and appreciate what Jesus wants to say through this particular parable. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Let me highlight as we go. Exactly like last week, actually, this parable begins with a commentary. This is not what Jesus said. Luke, as he's putting together these parables, and oh, Jesus said this and that, and putting them carefully together into what we now have as the Gospel of Luke, inserts his own commentary, just like last time. And this time he says, oh, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Well, if you try to read a little bit in between the lines, I think it's clear who Luke means when he says, some who trusted. Uh, we see throughout the Gospels that Jesus had quite a, a confrontational relationship, to put it lightly, with the Pharisees. And often they would spar back and forth, and there seemed to be attacks back and forth with words. Well, Luke says, huh, this parable might be for those, those types of people, some of those people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with a contempt. Well, Luke's given us his take on it. Let's see uh, what Jesus actually says in his, his words and dig into that. Jesus begins his story, a very, very short story, just a few sentences. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. This story starts very, very ordinarily. This is sort of like a once upon a time, there was a family, you know, living in a home. Well, once upon a time, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and at this point of the story, as a listener, you'd be like, of course, Pharisee, that's where they would hang out. But even in the first sentence, Jesus throws in a little bit of a twist. 
and a tax collector. Now, if we were listening to that, why would that immediately throw us slightly off? Well, we would begin by thinking of a Pharisee, and let's review what that is. A Pharisee is an expert in the law, highly regarded amongst those of Jewish faith. And since they help teach the law, of course they go to the temple. Of course, when you go to the temple, you'd expect to see uh, the rulers of the law. Using a pastor as an analogy is not great, but imagine a very religious person. You would expect to see them at the temple. They belong there. And not only do they belong there, that's probably their comfort zone. That's their territory. When a Pharisee walks into the temple, I think they would expect a certain amount of respect and reverence from others. And depending on this type of personality, the Pharisee, that might be their pride and joy. I value going to this uh, daily. I know in Asia, there are some who go to the different Buddhist temples very, very regularly. And I think there's a certain pride and joy of the routine of, I'm going uh, to do my offering or to do my act of worship. Well, this Pharisee is doing that. And there's nothing out of the ordinary for us as a listener until Jesus says, the second man is a tax collector. Well, if a Pharisee is a highly regarded person, then we ought to remind ourselves that a tax collector is the lowest honor. We don't expect the tax collector to go to the temple. And in fact, if there's a sense for the listeners, how dare the tax collector show his face there? And why would this be such a low honor? It's because tax collectors were seen as those who betrayed their own people. In Old Testament law, when Jewish people dealt with one another, let's suppose you have a friend and they are in great need and they need to borrow $10,000 for you. And you happen to have the ability to help that person. When you charge or give that $10,000 as a loan, God instructed Jewish people, don't charge interest. Don't take advantage of your fellow Jewish person. And so that was the ideal for God's law, that we ought to be generous. And when someone else is in a terrible situation and needs a lot, we ought not to profit off of that situation. And so that's God's ideal. What was the tax collector seen at that time? And quite common, we, it's hard to know how much a stereotype or how much was common, but tax collectors acted on behalf of the Roman Empire. They were the agents that helped fund and fuel the Roman Empire. So already, for Jewish people, they saw the Roman Empire as their oppressors, their persecutors, those who would violently deal with the Jewish people. So how dare some of our own people kind of work for the other side? And it does seem that often there is a practice where tax collectors would take bribes or overcharge their people. So instead of the generous Jewish person lending $10,000 without interest, if you were a corrupt tax collector, you might see, oh, I see uh, Joe owes $10,000. Well, he can't see what I have written here. I got some Roman guards beside me. If I say, Joe, you actually owe uh, 15000 by the way, what's Joe going to say? Not much. He can say. And so some, several of the tax collectors are seen as very wealthy and often having achieved their money through very dishonest means. So if you imagine what was seen as the ideal relationship between fellow Jews in times of need, and now under the Roman Empire, a tax collector who would betray his own people, take advantage of people, and perhaps his nice wealthy home and his nice wealthy clothes were actually acquired um, through persecuting and corruption of his own fellow people. So this is going to be good. Jesus has set this up. Who you expect the Pharisee has gone to the temple, and who you don't think should even show his face has shown up. It's going to be good. Well, what happens as they enter the temple? First, Jesus describes the man we expect to see at the temple, the Pharisee. And the Pharisee there stands by himself and listens to his prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day. I give tithes of all that I get. Well, I think Jesus sets up a sort of a humor situation. I, I don't imagine anyone would actually pray these words in this way. But what he shows of the Pharisees' prayer is someone of great pride and has contempt, which Luke kind of told us. This is what the parable is a bit about. That as the text, uh, sorry, as a Pharisee comes, he's quite pleased with himself. And he, maybe out of the corner of his eye, sees a tax collector and thinks, oh, this, this garbage is here. Well, good thing I'm here, and good thing I'm unlike this garbage. And God, thank you that I am this way. I am a great, wonderful gift to you, I'm sure, God. 
it is quite an interesting uh, prayer. Um, and I hope none of us have actually prayed words like these. But he goes on to actually say, well, he lists different sins and says, well, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And then he lists the things that a good Jewish person ought to do. And he says, yes, I fast twice a week. Um, I'm quite aware of that. I give a tithe of everything I get. And he lists his acts of righteousness as well. And so it's sort of an uncomfortable thing to listen to because you're like, well, yeah, it is good that he ties. It is good that he fasts. Well, I think where all the listeners feel very uncomfortable to think, what kind of prayer is this person praying to God to say uh, that's such pride and such a bloated sense of self? And so we're a little unsure what to do because this person ought to be a person of honor. Well, then it goes into the second man, and Jesus says, but the tax collector, in a great contrast, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The second man has a very short prayer. Essentially, have mercy on me. And as he approaches God, he recognizes his own place, and he refers to himself as a sinner, a recognition of his, the wrongs he has done in his life. There are many people who tried to draw it. I showed one to uh, for the children's. This is this is another one I found just kind of on Google Image Search. Imagine someone who's standing up very proudly in a temple for all who can see. Perhaps someone who's a little farther off, uh, probably very likely on his knees when I think about the words he speaks. It's such a different posture. And so once... Again, let's put ourselves in the shoes of listeners when we hear, oh, a tax collector showing up at the temple. That's going to make us feel uncomfortable. But then we see this tax collector pray in this heartfelt way in humility before God. And so I think Jesus' parable, uh, like many of his parables, masterfully does something in just a few sentences. Sets up something we expect, something we don't expect. A Pharisee going to the temple, we expect. A tax collector, we don't expect. A Pharisee ought to have a wonderful prayer before God. He ends up having a terrible, proud, disgusting type of prayer. And a tax collector who we would normally be disgusted with ends up having this humble heart before God. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, Jesus continues, and he has a bit of a conclusion that we'll reflect on. He says, Jesus says, I tell you, this man, that is the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, by justified, we mean in a sense of his heart was acceptable before God. He was actually the one in good relationship with God. Not the Pharisee with all the education, the prestige, all his acts of righteousness, all his avoidance of wrong things. Jesus actually lifts up and says the protagonist in this story is the one you're disgusted with. The one you would have been like, oh, why is this person going to the temple? And I hope this person doesn't come sit beside me at the temple either. Jesus looks at the posture of them. And why this is a twist is it's not saying, oh, we should all run in line and become tax collectors. And all of us should avoid being Pharisees. That's sort of the irony of the situation. And so there's not a simple conclusion. The the simple conclusion was, oh, we should be like the tax collector. Be like... Oh, should we go and work for the Roman Empire, betray our people, perhaps be corrupt and then come before God? Is that the right path? Or should we completely avoid being Pharisees and avoid tithing and fasting? Jesus is going to sum this up in his final sentence in his parable. He says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus contrasted those who are cast down and those who are lifted up. And he says it's opposite than what we think. Right now our world, perhaps more than ever, loves those who exalt themselves. I think there's no greater example of that than the social media influencer uh, now. It's a strange job, but yes, you can be a professional influencer and you can actually be way more wealthy than perhaps any of us in this room by being a social media influencer. And the way an influencer actually becomes popular is by promoting themselves, by exalting themselves, by trying to spread their videos and get the most people to link to it or to like it or to heart it. And so it's interesting that actually in our new social media landscape, Jesus' words are completely opposite. 
Um, by lifting ourselves up, one can create great fame and uh, fortune. Jesus says his kingdom is the other way around. If you try to exalt yourself, Jesus says, a humbling is coming your way. But for those who are humble, there is an exalting that is coming your way. This very much reminds me of in Matthew 5, where Jesus describes the Beatitudes, and they're often opposite, counterintuitive to what we would think. Let me read a portion of it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. The upside-down nature of God's kingdom is not a comfortable thing. The same way this parable makes us slightly uncomfortable, it feels good to feel good about ourselves. As Christians here at church, there can be a temptation of pride. Oh, we are here, and perhaps content and resentment towards the world or towards others. And we can easily elevate ourselves. I think one of the questions this Jesus parable demands of us is to reflect, who are the people that perhaps we are tempted to have contempt for? Who are the people that annoy us? Or maybe bring out that sting of pride that we do look down, we do judge others and think ourselves better than them. The tax collector in his story, it sounds uncomfortable. In some ways, it seems like this wonderful spiritual moment. But I assure you, to be on your knees and have a sense of your own sinfulness is not a very comfortable place to be. And I think of times where God has convicted me or humbled me from my pride, it is not a comfortable thing at all. But Jesus says there's something beautiful and good about that when we are down on our knees in this place of humility that we will be exalted. I was thinking about in our service how we try to facilitate that. There are parts of our service, particularly during confession or before we come to the Holy Table, where we actually all kneel as a church and we pray. In each of our services, whether Holy Communion or morning prayer, we do cry out, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. We actually pray the same prayer as this tax collector who recognizes when I'm before my holy God, I'm humbled because I know I am imperfect. I know I'm sinful. I know a holy God ought to have nothing to do with me. But as although our church service may facilitate that, we have to recognize the Pharisee was a very, quote-unquote, religious person who took part in many things, yet somehow his heart missed the point. Despite doing many right things and avoiding many wrong things, the Pharisee's heart ended up in a very bad place, which Jesus says, this is not the way to come before God. And so there is a posture of the heart that we ought to reflect on that no one else will be able to see from our outward actions, the things we avoid doing, the things that we do enjoy doing. Beyond that, there's something deeper inside of us, which is what is the posture of our heart towards God? Now, as we think about pride and humility, I do need to say a little bit about what I would call a note about pride and shame. These are often used in modern psychology now, and so we need to talk a little bit about that because I think we may misunderstand these words. Because in some ways, pride is something that can be a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I think many people long for other people to be proud of us. Uh, Maybe for all of us in this room, we long for our parents to say that primarily, or other people, our direct superiors or those who are above us. We long to hear people say, oh, I'm proud of you. And many of us may struggle with shame. And I want to talk a little bit about shame and humility. And there is a type of terrible, toxic shame uh, that leaves us just feeling terrible about ourselves. So let's talk a little bit about how should we as Christians understand pride and shame and the way I think scripture and what Jesus is looking for us in our posture. So pride... There is something to be proud of, that you are made in the image of God. You are treasured and loved by God, so much so that Christ went to the cross for you. So there is a type of healthy pride, and some of the ways I think we can tell the difference is the wrong kind of pride, which we see in the Pharisee, always takes us away from God. It always hardens our heart, 
it always makes it hard to love our neighbor as ourself. And this Pharisee is unable to love or think anything good of this tax collector beside them. And as Jesus points out, his heart is far from God. And so, as Christians, there should be something good we feel about ourselves because we know we are recipients of God's love. We are of value to God, and God loves us. But the kind of pride that Scripture is warning us about is the kind that takes us away from God, that takes us away from loving our neighbor and hardens our heart towards God. And so pride can be confusing because I think there are a couple dimensions of that word. So let's think about the right kind and the wrong kind. And also we need to think about this with shame and humility. And sometimes when I re- read this passage, I think of the tax collector not being, being able to lift his eyes to God. Well, there is something right about that. And there's a, also a type of toxic shame that we should talk about. I think the biblical right type of shame is not about tearing ourselves down. Just like I said, we are made in the image of God, treasured and loved by God. And I think, again, where we tell the good kind of shame and a toxic kind of shame, the good kind of shame actually brings us towards God. And some of you will be like, well, uh, in modern psychology, you'll say shame is always bad. Well, to be shameless is a terrible thing as well. And I think in our society, or if we see a criminal who's truly shameless, we understand that shame isn't entirely bad. The right kind of shame which this tax collector shows, brings you towards God. It's a recognition of, I am a sinner, and God, I need you. And though I'm not worthy to be before you, I realize that I am made in your image, and you too love me. And Jesus, you went to the cross for me. The toxic kind of shame leads us far from God. And we have to be aware, it is a very real temptation out there, and the devil will use healthy shame and often twist it into a toxic type of shame, that guess what? Just like pride drives us away from God and drives us away from others, toxic shame makes us hide. We hide from God and we hide from others and we dare not come out of our hiding. And so just to clarify a little bit, because for those of you who may go to counseling or study psychology, these terms are also used, pride and shame. We have to understand what I think Jesus is getting at and nuance what we understand about pride and humility and shame. What kind of heart does God look for? When I was a teenager, I thought there's many things I'm looking for, friends, perhaps in a romantic partner. Jesus' parable today is about the type of thing God is scanning for. When he looks into a crowd of people, God is looking for a heart of humility, a heart that is drawn to him, even when it is uncomfortable and takes an honest looking at ourselves. Jesus' parables are always so incredible. In just a few sentences, he can communicate so much. But even more than Jesus' words and teachings is the last sentence of this parable. Not only does Jesus say it, he actually lives it out. He actually lives it out and shows us that whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's what we see at at the very uh, end of our parable. And I want to read you a passage from Philippians, which I think brings us to life. And I almost wonder if the Apostle Paul was recalling Jesus' teaching on humility and pride. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in a very nature God, that is something very exalted, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Do you hear what Jesus said? Those who humble themselves. When Jesus came to us, he humbled himself. And Philippians continues on onward. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, who was humbled, God now lifted up as he went to the grave for us. Philippians here captures the essence and meat of Jesus' parable. Jesus did the dirtiest job of them all, going to the cross to pay for our sin, to pay the price of death. 
But the Father's heart, what does the Father look for? A heart of humility and servanthood, and has now exalted him. Brothers and sisters, where are you being humbled? It's not a comfortable place to be. We may be humbled in our personal lives. Uh, churches around the world, including ours, uh, COVID hit us badly. It is a humbling time to be a Christian in the church, in our society. And sometimes our places of humility, they may last years. We may not even see where the end of it is. But hear these words of Jesus. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. This tax collector who dared not lift his head. You can imagine when you feel very badly about something, how you don't even want to look someone in the eyes. Well, one day God the Father will lift his head. And that is the gospel message for you and I. That amidst our humility, hopelessness, or even when we face death, that God is the lifter of our head, our Lord and Savior. And in humility, the seeds of God's true kingdom are sown, and his blessing and life will come. Jesus shows us this. He walks the path, and he gives himself to us. His body is broken for us in humility. His blood is shed for you and I in humility. But now take heart. This Jesus now reigns on high at the right hand of the Father. Amen.